Good morning or oh, good afternoon to who is joining from China. My name is Alessio Petino. I'm the Knowledge Coordinator at the USME Center. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to moderate this webinar on fashion and apparel in, in China. Of course, this uh, is a very important sector for, for Europe. Uh, a lot of brands are, a lot of European brands are very um, well known in China and perform very well in China on this. Um, yet it's a very challenging market and this is one of the reasons why we are doing this webinar together uh, today together with the China Italy Chamber of Commerce. Um, before we start, um, so today's event we will be, there will be, we have three uh, distinguished speakers joining this event, um, giving presentations, um, addressing different angles of, of the sector. Uh, first, we will um, have an overview of different market entry strategies um, that European brands uh, can choose, but also marketing strategies and the preferences of Chinese consumers and so on. The second presentation will focus on the customs requirement. Um, in particular, how the uh, particular what's happening with the logistics uh, with the transportation sector, but then um, all the basically an overview of how the process of uh, customs clearance will uh, will take place. Last presentation will focus exclusively on the taxation side of the export, both for general trade as well as for cross-border e-commerce. There will be a Q&A session at the end, but of course, if you have um, any questions, um, you are encouraged to uh, write them in the Q&A part um, as soon as you have them. Uh, before starting, I would like to give a very uh, brief introduction of the USME Center. The USME Center is a project funded by the European Commission uh, since 2010, and it helps European business, small and medium-sized enterprises to export to China, to do business to China. And uh, we are in a third phase, and which will run until March this year, but there will probably be another one coming after, right after it. Um, so um, we are implemented by a consortium of chambers of, of five chambers of commerce and business organizations, which you can see on the bottom of the slides. And among these, the China Inter Chamber of Commerce is the one that coordinates the consortium. And of course, the one um, co-organizing co this webinar today. Uh, we partner up with a lot of agencies from government, business, and, and we operate out of a um, physical office here in Beijing, which is also where I'm based. Um, we, we provide four main services. The first one is the knowledge center. Basically, we write market reports, guidelines, um, and case studies on different sectors. Um, we have an advice center, basically a sort of help desk that European companies can use. You can write questions to us. Um, also technical questions, very specific questions, and then one of our experts will um, help you respond to these questions, absolutely free of charge. We have a training center, basically what we're doing today, we, are, we, we do webinars and workshops on different sectors or different topics. And last, we have an advocacy platform with, through which we spread, disseminate information on new regulations in China, just for comments and so on. Um, a very quick overview of what's coming next. We have a lots of uh, lots of activities planned. Um, we're going to have a short break, a break for the Chinese New Year next uh, week. But in mid February, we will, we will resume more activities. We have a series of webinars planned on different aspects, horizontal aspects, payment, cross border payments, cross cultural communication, and um, and so on. We also have a, re a report. We made a report last uh, year in, during the summer about um, e commerce, e commerce in China, and you know, giving an introduction, introducing uh, the made the most important platforms for e commerce in China, social e commerce, and so on. Also, cost how much does it cost to open a store on these platforms, and so on. Um, and then we have, as I mentioned, we also have frequently asked questions and so on. I would like now to show very briefly a short video about one of the tools we have is called self-diagnosis tool. Basically it's a sort of quiz on different aspects um, that basically uh, test your, your knowledge uh, of, of different aspects of China. There are um, you know, several questions and different, uh, different answers. And then at the end, based, based on, the, on the answers that you selected, you will receive a score and there will be um, an explanation of the answers, if they were right or wrong, um, links to uh, FAQs that we have, external reports or recordings of previous webinars that we had. So I invite you to, to do this because uh, we think it's very useful. Um, next, now I would give the floor to Mr. Lorenzo Riccardi 
who will be one of the speakers today, but at the same time, he's the managing director of RSA Asia, but at the same time, he's also the treasurer of uh, China Italy Chamber of Commerce. Um, for a short introduction, he will give a short introduction on CICC. Thank you, Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessio. I would like to ask uh, um, for organizing this uh, event, uh, joint event together with China Italy Chamber of Commerce. We are glad as a chamber to, to participate, joint, uh, coordinate uh, more and more activities all over China, involving also our members, our companies, uh, investing from Italy to China. And um, a large part of these, they are in the fashion and, and retail sector. <clears throat> Actually, the China Italy Chamber of Commerce, and, and we can go to the next slide, um, is a, an organization recognized by both the government of Italy and the government of China, and uh, has more than 30 years history. And, um, and we reached in, in 2021 838 members. That is a significant number for our chamber. Um, that is showing the okay, I think there is a small technical issue with the connection of Mr. Riccardi. I don't know if Mr. Riccardi is still there. Okay, then maybe we wait a couple of minutes. Um, maybe, maybe I would. Uh, we could just go ahead with the with the with the webinar. Mr. Riccardi will be a speaker later, so he will have the opportunity to reintroduce this uh, later. So moving on, um, then I would, um, yeah, moving on here. Yeah, so it's my pleasure to um, introduce Ms. Zoe Chen, who is the China Chief Representative of Camera Nazionale della Moda Italiana or Italian Fashion Council. So he's responsible for developing the China Chinese partnerships and, and, and networks for, for the Italian Fashion Council and to manage relevant affairs events, promoting big flagship events such as Milan Fashion Week um, and, and so on. She has been operating in this industry for many years. So she's the person uh, you have to uh, get in contact with for, for, for understanding how the sector works or, or to if you want to uh, reach out to, to, to know other people, she is the person for you. So we really look forward to your presentation, Zoe. Thank you again for being here with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessio, for the introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. This is Zoe Chen from Gamela Moda, uh, Italian National Fashion Council. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to be invited by EU um, SME and the CICC to participate in today's uh, webinar. Um, uh, we are here in China not only to promote uh, Milan Fashion Week and the Italian Fashion Council, uh, uh, Italian fashion culture, but also uh, building up a crossover bridge <clears throat> and trying to help Italian fashion brands to the greatest extent. So we all know that uh, China is an uh, important business market with uh, a lot of potentials. And this market has its rules and its charms, which closely linked with the evolution of the society and the development of Chinese consumer. So to seize this opportunity, um, brands need to understand it first uh, in order to be able to take this uh, advantage of this huge potential with comfort and uh, confidence. So today, uh, my sharing will contain three parts. First, there will uh, be a brief introduction on China apparel consumption market. And uh, second, uh, I will share some marketing and the cultural uh, preference of the Chinese consumers. And to end up, uh, we'll share some notes on the IP uh, protection. Uh, next page, please, uh, Alessio. <clears throat> yeah, mm, also next page. I finished this. Yeah, uh, next and the next. <laughs> so let's see the, yeah. So the first, um, let's see the um, fashion um, apparel market scale and the uh, current trends to have a whole picture. Uh, could you please move um, next? Mm. So uh, for the market scale, let's see some figures. 
according to China National Bureau of Statistics, uh, in the year of 2021, China's retail sales of consumption goods uh, total 39 trillion yuan, uh, which has a 12.9% increase of the con consumption volume. And among this total, 1,000 384 billion yuan was spending on the clothing, footwear, uh, headgear, and knitwear. Um, and for the disposable income for the citizen, in 2021, for the uh, PCDI, uh, we have a 9.1% increase, and the spending on the appeal uh, takes 5.9% of the consumption. So we see this uh, growth of the consumption power. And the new retail model shows also a rapid uh, recovery on online consumption of clothing. And um, for the wearing goods, uh, online sales rose 5.8% from a year earlier. And from Ali data report till last year, Taobao Timo platform women's clothing rose 24%, uh, 16.4% growth for women uh, for men's clothing, and 15% for children's clothing, and 31% for sportswear. So we see a growth, a huge growth on sportswear. I will develop uh, later. Uh, China market e evolves very quickly and tremendous changes have been taking place during these two years. So there are some must known points for the current China apparel consumption market. The next page, please. So um, three, three um, trends that we need to know for the Chinese market. The first is the new stage of e-commerce. So the pandemic has brought huge challenge to the apparel market, accelerate the uh, implementation of the new retail model. Uh, companies uh, embrace at a larger and deeper level uh, into the e-commerce. So we can see from uh, annual report of China garment industry uh, for the uh, passing year, Mm, we have uh, the e-commerce uh, for apparel industry reached to 433 uh, billion yuan, which takes 4% of the whole China e-commerce scale. And this number will increase uh, to 10% till 2020. And uh, so brands will see how can we embrace this e-commerce in China? So uh, this, the, there are many, many channels. For example, the brand can build up the official website and also uh, the uh, WeChat program, which is uh, very new and it can buy uh, branding and selling is a new model. And the second, uh, there are full category e-commerce platforms that for you to choose, for example, Taobao, Timo, and the GD, Dingdong, which I think you have already heard the names. And another one is also a, a choice access to the e-commerce world is the cross-border e-commerce platform. In particular, the global fashion shopping platform, for example, Farfetch, Netta Porter, and uh, Matches Fashion, etc. These three are relevant uh, active in China in terms of service logistics convenience, especially Farfetch. They have a huge uh, development this year in China's consider. Uh, recent year, uh, also a word become very popular in both marketing and sales is private domain traffic. And this become an important market re resource and generated a new way of selling such as the KOL live streaming and WeChat e-commerce, et cetera. So from a questionnaire survey from a WeMob Research Center, 70% 70, 70 of users um, have used the live streaming shopping experience. And more than 50% of the users have one to two times the live streaming shopping experience by month. Um, for the e-commerce stores on the platform, uh, more than 57% of them uh, did the live streaming sales. So um, during this live streaming for category, apparel category takes 46%. And uh, women's wear takes the 
biggest percentage among, among it. And uh, for the online streaming register user account number reached to 504 million in 2019. It's, it's uh, more than one third China population. And this number continue grow, growing till uh, last year, 2020. Uh, this increased up to 526 billion registered users. So um, we, we see uh, all this uh, growth on e-commerce. However, this implementation of online streaming is not only in retail. Uh, this new way of selling and promoting also penetrated into the B2B business in China apparel industry and also supply chain, for example, the production factories and also retail malls. So e-commerce is uh, accelerated by the pandemic. A rapid development of the digital uh, economy has become a stronger um, um, application thanks to the 5G technology and also the development of a smart e-shopping scenario. So more customers will rely more on this digital way. Um, so I suggest for brands who is not ready to establish the team in China for retail store uh, development could also consider a proper e-commerce way to enter Chinese market. And the online development could be an alternative at first stage to reach Chinese consumers with accurate marketing plan and uh, to communicate the brand message. So. Um, suggested platform could consider a WeChat ecosystem, a Tmall official eShop. These two uh, platforms uh, for brands could build an integrated visual and uh, uh, sales environment, create uh, with existing and potential consumers to have a first-hand uh, market backup. So a second trend that we need to know notice that it's not easy not to say it is the latest tax-free policies, uh, which drives uh, rapid growth of luxury goods uh, market in China. Um, we, we know that um, Chinese consumers overseas purchase of tax-free goods total more than 180 billion yuan, counting for nearly half of the world's taxation, tax-free compensation, <coughs> consumption, sorry. So um, with this severe uh, impact of the pandemic, the overseas consumption uh, market, the Chinese government uh, promote a double uh, circulation at home and a broad policy. So government has uh, liberalized the examination and proof, uh, approval for the tax-free lessons and raised the quota of tax-free shopping in outlining islands and uh, in central cities. So naturally this part of consumption flowing back to China, especially for luxury uh, sector in apparel industry. So duty-free shop quota for um, outlining uh, island visitors has been increased from 30,000 yuan to 100,000 yuan per person per year. And uh, this, the uh, duty-free goods categories also increased from 38 to 45. So uh, we can um, we can take uh, next page, please. We can take Hainan province as an example. Um, the huge attraction. Uh, next page, please. Huge attraction. Um, next page. The yeah. Yeah, huge attraction uh, with more than 70% increase uh, in both sales and visitors. So uh, there is a large potential. So under this new tax-free policies, there will be uh, more projects in central cities in China. And also there is the potential for foreign brands, especially for high-ending for high -end positioning and high-quality brand to consider this business development on duty-free retail projects. So there are new uh, projects to come and you can pay some attention to, to see the uh, news. And the third trend um, uh, for this uh, market, 
uh, say if you don't mind, we can go. Yes, go up to this page. Yeah. The third trend uh, for the apparel market is the increasing uh, need for the sportswear, homeware, and casual wear. Um, the radical lifestyle shifts uh, motivated consumers to uh, make in intentional, mindful, and rational decisions in recent two years. And the consumers put, uh, they're putting their plans into motion, taking chances and uh, saving the moment to enjoy life and family time. And this change, uh, plus the shift of working and the travel routine has created uh, a market increase on sports and the casual wear uh, and home wear categories. So mentioning sports wear, uh, ski collection shows uh, its strengths in China these two years, uh, approaching to the event of the Beijing Winter Olympics, which has 12 days, I, th I think. Luxury brands has launched the ski uh, collections for China market too. For example, Prada, Fendi, Xenia, uh, Bali, Chanel, Dior, etc. And uh, not only luxury brands, e-commerce platform, for example, Netta Porter or uh, my, my Teresa also opened the ski sector uh, on their platforms to attract targeted uh, customers. And in the past two years, even for uh, many Chinese brands who specialize in winter clothing and also start launching their ski line uh, last year. Um, so uh, after China's successful bid uh, to host the Winter Olympics, this sport is entering into young generation's lifestyle. And um, China also has a slogan to encourage people to join this industry by saying 300 million people go on ice and snow. So huge uh, enthusiasm uh, for outdoor skinning, um, mountaineering and uh, rock climbing have become a trend. So this is the consumption market potential for us. Uh, next page and the next, the following, I will share uh, a showcase of next page uh, to, to the Fendi showcase, please. Yeah, yeah. so um, for example, uh, Fendi has uh, launched the Fendi Cafe in Changbai uh, Mountain Ski Resort to create a special and unexpected uh, consumers experience and this uh, create a natural social buzz from uh, targeted customers and also KOL um, and perfectly combine the uh, lifestyle and the fashion collection together to create a community uh, influence. Next page please. Um, also Xenia uh, launched uh, the first collection of Xenia's new journey on the outdoor collection in the center of Shanghai. Um, so these are some showcase to show the luxury captured the chance, the potential of the market. Um, and just, okay, thank you. And the second big part of my sharing will uh, about the consumers because it's always to know uh, before to win. Right. So um, next page. So first, um, there are two uh, general uh, generation groups that need us to pay more attention on the studies of their consumption behaviors and also their preference to the to make the marketing strategies. So Y generation is also called millennials, uh, refer to the generation from 84 to 95. And um, the post uh, China's post the 80s and post the 90s population uh, about 400, uh, 450 million, 30% uh, of the population. So, and also their uh, average uh, annual income is also keep increasing. So they are a big group of uh, high consumption power and they pay more attention to the quality, the service, and the pursue the individualism and the experience driven consumption are their um, preference for this group. And the for Gen Z uh, refers to the generation from uh, born uh, from 95 to 2009. And the number of this generation, um, more than 226 million, uh, accounts for 16% of the total population. But looking at the field of the fashion consumption, this group of Gen Z uh, will continue uh, growth 
um, to make a fashion industry growth around uh, three to 4.5 percent uh, growth. So in China, the Gen Z witness the country's economic growth yeah, sure. and the rise of the comprehensive national power. So patriotism is a common point on them. They are also called uh, the internet citizen surrounded and also have a strong ability to get and filter the information from internet. Uh, so they will also largely influenced by the digital uh, communication, which I think is a good opportunity for brands who is not coming to the Chinese market yet. Um, they are full uh, ambition and personality, self-esteem, and the strong desire to be recognized and um, this group of people is growing into the future of China's new economy, new consumption, and become the dominant force of the new culture for sure. Um, so for many uh, industry report and the survey showed that the Chinese consumers uh, consumption philosophy is undergoing a much faster upgrade. So today I, I will share three points uh, for these two generations. Uh, next page, please. So the first will be uh, the identity uh, recognition. So in, in the recent years, there is uh, a national tide, Chinese national tide uh, in, the, in, the, in the fashion industry. And this trend is catering to the Chinese consumers' upgrowing identity esteem. And the Chinese culture elements and designs uh, stories are integrated into the fashion design. For example, uh, the Chinese zodiac signs. Uh, signs. Uh, many uh, brands launches the Chinese New Year collection, and some of them even very creative uh, to create uh, the uh, Chinese zodiac or uh, for, for the WeChat emojis. For example, Valentino create a tiger zodiac emoji, Fendi has the panda emoji, etc. And the Chinese uh, traditional craftsmanship is also uh, very important um, uh, to be inserted in, in, in all these designs. Uh, for example, the embroidery, Marnie has taken three years to launch a project with Miao Embroidery has a very good feedback. And also many street fashion brands insert images uh, from uh, a story book called A Classic of Mountain and Seas, uh, one of the oldest Chinese books of myth and legend. So all this we see um, the interpretation of the Chinese culture. But one thing need to be pay attention is the way of the interpretation and the recreated images. Uh, we should avoid the culture taboo and inappropriate uh, wording or some bad luck brain images. So to understand uh, the Chinese culture from business marketing point of view, uh, traditional festivals are important to take consideration from marketing campaign or even to product design aspect. So interesting stories uh, and interaction marketing campaign will increase the consumer's engagement and uh, the uh, emotional inclination. Um, and this is the cultural perspective. Another dimension for identity recognition to rouse the emotional uh, uh, resonance is the community culture identity that explains the popular <clears throat> the popular trend of streetwear so whether the brand uh, could deliver a clear message of culture and the community identity will obtain a, a much loyal client and the second uh, point is the uh, growth of sustainability consciousness so always since the breakout of the pandemic, people attract more, uh, in, mm, attach more uh, uh, importance to the environment, healthy lifestyle, and the value the harmonious relationship between human and the nature. And the public is beginning to realize that consumption is no longer an individual act, but also um, linked to uh, the earth's environment and the natural resources. So a large group of consumer acclaim uh, during the surveys and the reports that they are more likely to buy more eco-friendly products than buying less. So this shift is particularly uh, pronounced among younger consumers. And also uh, to, um, yeah, um, 
and this, of course, are the uh, promising side of the report and the surveys. Um, there's a Chinese saying that uh, the unity, the the unity of knowledge and action. So people who are doing the survey will for sure support the sustainability, but in real consumption, there are so many factors could influence the final uh, choice. So I think for sustainable fashion, the dominant role is still more from the uh, company and the society side than the consumer side. So that needs um, brands to be clever enough to create sustainable items uh, at this stage to balance the social responsibility and also the business development. So for example, I um, share a showcase of uh, uh, Italian brand Valentino, uh, next page please, uh, which uh, launched uh, very recently in, in January, uh, a project called Open for a Change Project. So this project uh, I, I would like to share because it's perfectly combined the sustainability concept and uh, the consumption trend they choose the most best seller iconic sneakers and also the digital marketing. Um, except the uh, e-communication e online for all the different parts of a material from eco cycle material, but also the launch will cover uh, all the e-commerce channels. So I think that's a, a very good way <clears throat> to implement uh, this concept and into the business uh, development. Um, uh, previous page please and the third will be uh, the consumption upgrading which is a very good news for all the companies um, for Chinese consumer no matter their age group or buying power um, the their consumption is upgrading non-stop and this creates the opportunities for brand but also at the same time challenges so we need to think uh, when recruiting new customers how to keep the existing clients loyal consumption upgrading towards higher quality or towards better consumption uh, consumer experience are always key to maintain the customer and also uh, important to recruit new ones. So mm, high, higher quality is like uh, upgrading at all level. Uh, for example, is the product design is more attractive, collection are more has uh, more choices or whether the after services is convenient. For example, Brunello Cucinelli provide free services for maintenance recently. Um, Chanel and Hermes opened their after sales service store in Japan. So this all shows the importance um, to pay attention for, for this service. So uh, the upgrading is also from intangible to, to from tangible to intangible values. So now customer, Chinese customer purchase not only for the value of the using, but also pay for the stories and even a lot pay for supporting the brand ambassadors as well. So customer um, consumer experience uh, is another point to attract consumers. Um, that's why we see many brands organize uh, the uh, um, fan fancy and fantastic VIC uh, events, uh, which which become a little bit severe competition, you know, because they share the all this uh, group of uh, consumers for for brands who is not coming to China. I think it's difficult to organize this face to face uh, event, but there's also a way. For example, if your channel uh, you are selling your 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 products in uh, multiple brand. Um, uh, platform shops like uh, Lancaford or other um, buying stores, I think it's also good to consider organizing together with them some face-to-face um, -face events as well. That will be uh, also a good way to make the link. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, to end, the ending part, um, because Alessio is very uh, cons conscious and uh, for the IP protection, uh, I will just uh, quickly uh, give some uh, notes and the sharing on this point. Um, the first page, I 
uh, I find a research they are uh, giving some uh, samples of seven foreign brands, um, the, the situation of their registration for the patent and uh, uh, trademark. Uh, so just uh, to give uh, you a big picture to see, uh, actually foreign brands, especially uh, luxury brands that are very active and pay more attention on this point. Um, the average of their um, regis uh, registered trademarks and patents even higher than the Chinese fashion in the market. So um, uh, next page, please. So some suggestions for uh, IP protection. I think three steps are very important. So, uh, so the first brands uh, should establish and adjust their into uh, IP uh, IP strategy according to its different business develop uh, development stages because um, the in different stages the needs and the strategy are not the same and it's also costly so it's good to establish that strategy and the second for uh, patent and trademark and other uh, intellectual property registration in China, um, national intellectual property administration are very essential. So in particular, for uh, companies core business, the IP registration is on the top list. And the third one is um, uh, also better for foreign companies to establish the uh, IP management system and this uh, and also an effective assessment in order to analyze the various uh, type of IP risks and also to solve the potential problem in the head. Uh, next page please. And for uh, I think for uh, emerging brands and uh, independent de designers uh, how to protect their uh, design uh, is very important. So uh, based on China's current legislation and uh, uh, the practice, um, under a normal circumstance, uh, we always do uh, patent and the copyright registration. And uh, because normally the trademark rights is only protect the local, but under certain, certain um, circumstances if the certain design is registered on the logo that's we can use this uh, way to protect and uh, yeah and the one one thing I just want to mention is normally the procedure for uh, patent design registration review and the circle takes six to nine months but now there's a new is the digital platform uh, which can be shortened to seven to ten days so this is uh, very good news for, for us. Um, I think uh, next page. Mm. So um, I think it's almost about this. There are some points I listed uh, for co-branding collaboration uh, because um, the co-branding collaboration is very popular nowadays in the market and uh, um, uh, in, in the same industry or cross border in different categories uh, also will um, encounter the risks. So <clears throat> the <clears throat> first very important is to um, examine the reputation of the partner and uh, the partners and also the right basis on the co-branding collaboration. Um, for example, uh, there's a brand who, is, uh, who wants to um, car brand who wants to do the co-branding with Marvel, uh, whose main business is animation and film. But actually Marvel uh, for the car industry, the trademark is not registered. The owner is on someone else. So if Marvel wants to do the co-branding collaboration with a car brand, that will face a higher risk. So the basic uh, rights on the partners, whether in this category, uh, should be pay more attention. And the second, um, also for the collaboration, it is very essential to unify and clear the co-branded name usage rules. 
and also uh, in this case to prevent the uh, exceeding the uh, usage from exceeding the scope or using the co-branded brand improperly. Uh, there's also one case that happened in China very recently, a Chinese garment brand, I, I didn't mention the name now, um, collaborated with a foreign, foreign artist, but the actual operation from uh, the brand set is far beyond the scope. And uh, in the end, was accused of the copyright infringe and caused a very bad influence on the brand image. So, I because IP protection is a very professional <laughs> issue. So, just to draw attention for you, um, detailed information should consult professional insti uh, in institute. So, yeah. So, this is my sharing for today. Sorry for speaking too fast, and I hope this can be helpful uh, to have a little more concrete and uh, updated picture of the China market. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you very much for this uh, very good presentation. And maybe I will just take your last point on IP uh, about the importance, of course, of being very aware of these issues and then to be prepared. I would like to invite all the participants to uh, follow the China IP SME Help Desk, which is another project funded by the European Union. It's basically very similar to what we do, but uh, focuses 100% uh, on IP issues. And if you have any questions on IP, they have lots of experts in different industries that could uh, you know, give you answers. They can tell you which are the most frequent cases uh, of, of infringement or bad faith registration they can tell you how much does it cost to apply for a design patent or, or a, um, you know, or they, they can provide free uh, advice to, to you. China IP SME Help Desk. And um, I invite you to, to follow them. Another comment I would like to make, uh, you, we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, e-commerce, uh, you know, all, all these platforms, WeChat. Uh, at the USME Center, we have guidelines on how to open stores on Tmall, on WeChat, how much does it cost, but also, uh, also, also on other platforms, which are, let's say, less common, uh, at least abroad, uh, but very common in China, like, like Little Red Book, Kaola, or things, uh, or other platforms like this. Um, so if you have any questions, if you want to dig deeper into any of these aspects, contact us or, of course, Zoe um, for, for, for more details. I will now move to the second uh, presentation. Let me share my, uh, my slide. <laughs> um, so I will... Uh, I will introduce now the second speaker of today's webinar, Mr. Gabriele Bessi, who is the branch manager of Savino del Bene, uh, Shanghai branch, of course. Um, so Gabriele is based in Shanghai, and um, um, yeah, he is um, also very active within China Italy Chamber of Commerce Logistics Working Group. He has been operating in China for 11 years and supporting a lot of companies to um, optimizing their supply chain and import export activities. So. Um, yeah, Gabriele, thank you for being with us. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can share your slides and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Alessio. Okay. Okay, today we will we'll have uh, an overview of the uh, transportation, custom clearance, uh, labeling uh, in order to uh, import uh, fashion goods into, into China. Okay, so the, the most common uh, shipping mode for uh, garments, apparel and uh, and accessories is the air freight mode. So in order to, um, I think it's important to understand what's the current scenario we are, we are working. And I will try to do it uh, analyzing three main uh, figures, which are about the global demand, the capacity and the air freight rates. So, um, Globally, the, the demand uh, um, increased 14% uh, by October uh, 
2021. Uh, um, however, for what we saw in the last few months uh, from November, December, and uh, this current month, uh, we expect uh, also also an increase on this uh, on this percentage. I can show you uh, this uh, uh, this graphic, uh, and you can see what is the what is the um, um, development of the of the demand starting from uh, last year in October was minus seven percent compared to the pre pandemic. Uh, uh, period and now is at uh, 14 percent we don't have actual data on november and december yet the uh, capacity which is one of the um, uh, main issue we are seeing uh, in the last uh, in the last two years uh, is down by the by the 17 percent um, to be back to the previous slide and it's 17%, and you can see that the uh, passenger capacity is also is down by the 28%. This is globally. If uh, uh, we want, if we want to consider the the route that we are discussing today, which is Europe to to China, I can tell you that uh, uh, now there are less than 500 um, weekly. Uh, inbound connections. Um, while before the before the pandemic, there were over ten thousand weekly flight connections. This is just to give you an idea of what's the of what's the air freight uh, situation nowadays. Um, let's see the last uh, last figure, which is the uh, last but not least, the the rates. If we consider uh, the two thousand nineteen as the as the baseline, we saw an increase uh, un until the end of two thousand twenty one by the one hundred twenty six percent. So it's quite uh, considerable and important for you to consider it. So this is the about the about the transportation. Let's see now was the um, sorry the um, custom clearance uh, uh, flow and uh, and uh, and procedure to import uh, uh, garments into china the one of the most uh, important uh, uh, thing to do is the is the preparation of the documentation um, the main uh, documents needed are the detail, a detailed packing list, uh, the invoice, the, the airway bill, the sales contract between the, the shipper and the, and the importer, and in cases needed, the certificate of origin. Um, most importantly is also to provide uh, uh, the so-called master file, uh, the master file is usually an Excel file which contains uh, uh, picture and uh, all kind of information about the about the each uh, piece that uh, we want to import in China. This give you uh, give a, give the custom broker all the information order to select the correct HS code to be declared in the custom declaration. We will see then that the master file is also we will also be used for the for the labeling translation and uh, contents to be printed on uh, on each label. So we will see it later. After the, the preparation of the documents, which can be done before the cargo arrives in uh, in, uh, in in China, uh, there, will, there is the custom clearance and um, handled by the custom broker, which will uh, issue the custom declaration through EDI, directly connected with the custom. And uh, usually in, uh, in about an hour, uh, will be provided with the uh, duty, duty payment list. And the duty can be paid directly by the importer, the, 
but imported through the uh, single window platform. Each, uh, each uh, importers can, re can register into this, uh, into this platform and they can directly pay to the, to the custom. Once, cast once the um, uh, custom is released, the shipment is released, uh, custom can randomly inspect the, the, the cargo. Uh, and after that, uh, now consider the custom inspection ratio is quite, uh, is quite low and is uh, random. And after that, it can be delivered to the, to the, final, uh, to the final site. Usually is a logistic hub where um, all procedures of labeling and uh, distribution are handled. Uh, on this site, uh, there can be also uh, some on, some uh, on spot inspection, which uh, so the custom authority will take appointment with the uh, brand and the logistic hub. And in that case, they can um, inspect the cargo. Uh, also sample the cargo means uh, taking uh, some samples uh, and uh, they can do some, uh, also some uh, test on, uh, on each piece. Consider that uh, in case, uh, these, these cases are quite, uh, and also um, not, many, uh, not so many nowadays, uh, but any, anyway, in case uh, um, there is this inspection, uh, these items cannot be sold uh, into, the, into the market. You need to, to wait for the test report. So this is a, daily, a list of the most common um, HS code, family of HS code and uh, their uh, related duty. <clears throat> As you can see, most of the duty for garments and accessories uh, are six, eight, or 10%. Now let's have a, an overview about the, about the uh, labeling and the quality requirements uh, set for the, for the garments and accessories. So all, uh, all products uh, to be sold and distributed into the Chinese market, uh, they have to meet, must meet the standards uh, stated on the GB standards. Um, different commodity have different, uh, different standards that are all regulated and can be find uh, all the information about the uh, requirements for the product and their labeling. So the procedure that uh, we can uh, we can follow the usually is follow for the for the correct labeling is to um, let the your uh, logistic uh, provider in case is uh, um, organized with a with a warehouse uh, and a, with a fashion background they can uh, require you a master file, the same file I discussed before. Uh, in this master file, I need to provide all the uh, most common information about composition, uh, size, uh, picture, um, price, uh, and uh, the, the, logistic, the logistic provider will provide, uh, will fill inside this, uh, this file with the, uh, the GB standards, safety code, and uh, in case you need also a translation into Chinese. Now I can show you uh, what are the um, required information in, the, in each labels. So in the hand tag, you can see uh, a name of the commodity, the size, the main fabric and, uh, and composition, 
the standard, the GB standards that I referred to, safety, safety hood, uh, the, the washing instruction, and also the, the company information uh, of, the, of the importer. So the permanent label or a washing label that has to be sewed or printed on the, on the, on the garment, uh, usually contain the size, uh, again, the composition and the, and the washing instruction. So, um, what we what we what we seen uh, before is the custom clearance and process for the um, general trade. So there is also uh, the cross border e commerce. So uh, foreign established companies uh, uh, even are not uh, uh, they don't have any local organization in China. Um, they can sell uh, their products uh, through the through this uh, uh, cross-border e-commerce platform, and there are mainly two two ways to do that. One is the bonded uh, warehouse warehouse mode, uh, which basically uh, for which basically um, the 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 shipper. The, the manufacturer uh, ship a stock of goods to a, a entitled bond warehouse for, for cross-border in China. Um, in this bond warehouse, there will be a listings uh, and uh, uh, to, the, um, to the custom. Um, after the, the custom approval, uh, customers in China, local customers in China, can set their, uh, can place their order to the e-commerce platform, and uh, through the green channel in um, uh, in the bond warehouse, uh, the the item will be custom cleared and uh, delivered directly to the to the final customer. Usually, the both logistics and uh, also payment uh, to the to the manufacturer and also the duty payment uh, are directly handled through the through the e-commerce platform. Uh, so mm, this is the I think is the uh, preferred mode also by the by the final customer because the, 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 the cargo is already into, is in China, even if in a bonded warehouse. So there is a quite quick uh, um, delivery transit time to the, to the final customer. Another way is the direct shipping mode, which doesn't require a, a stock of goods in, uh, in China, uh, so uh, the final uh, final customer will place the order still to the e-commerce platform. Um, the order will be received by the by the manufacturer, with which which will dispatch the 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 item, uh, shipping it uh, usually by by couriers, international couriers. And uh, then it will follow the, the usual, uh, uh, once arriving in China, will follow the usual uh, custom clearance process. Uh, in this case, uh, there is not the 100%, uh, usually the 100% uh, satisfaction of the final, uh, final customer because of the um, transit time and uh, timing in order to, to finally receive the, the, the purchase. Also in this case, uh, both payment to the, to the manufacturer, payment to the uh, custom for the duties are also handled by the e-commerce uh, platform.
Okay, so thank you for the attention. Thank you, Gabriele. Thank you for, for your presentation. And uh, we, we, it was very useful for us, especially the labels part. I think it's always very tricky. Um, there are uh, th there are a few questions in the Q and A, but we will address them later in the next uh, in the Q and A session. Of course, if there are other questions in the meantime, you know, please feel please feel free to write them. Um, I will now move into the last presentation of today. Let me share my screen. Uh, if if Gabriel, if you can please stop sharing your screen so yes. that we can. So it's my, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Uh, Lorenzo Riccardi. Lorenzo Riccardi is the managing partner at RSA Asia. Um, and then at the same time, he's also, uh, uh, he also teaches uh, tax related uh, matters at various universities in China, Xi'an Zhaotong, Liverpool University, Peck University, Shanghai Zhaotong, and so on. Um, he's auditor is an auditor and an advisor for several companies, and uh, as we mentioned, uh, head of tax of the and managing partner of the consulting firm RSA. Um, thank you, Lorenzo, for being with us. I'll share your slides now, and you should be able to see to see them now. And the floor is yours. Grazie Alessio. I hope the, the, the connection will work well <clears throat> and it seems the, the, the Zoom version uh, is, is also working. So I, I prepared some materials uh, with an overview of uh, tax trends uh, and uh, tax benefits for companies exporting to China and for companies investing in China, doing business generally in China. And uh, we can skip to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, the materials later uh, can also be shared for the participants who are interested in getting the, the materials. Here is a recent uh, uh, update, uh, I believe 15 January 2022, we got the confirmation by China Customs of the official uh, figures of the international trade between China and the world. And of course, we are very interested in, in Italy as China Italy Chamber of Commerce, but we are interested in uh, the other uh, European uh, countries as uh, USME Center. And generally, we are interested in understanding the, the gap, the differences, the, the trends uh, on uh, doing business, exporting uh, and trading between China and the world. So the, the trend that we saw during 2021 was related to uh, an increased export um, from Italy to China um, that was higher compared to, let's say, G7 countries or compared to the top economies from European Union and the United States. Uh, this comparison is mainly on the increased percentage of export from Italy to China. And um, there are other uh, opinions on, on the trend of this export impacted by um, fluctuation of uh, currency, RMB US dollar and, and therefore RMB uh, Euro, and also impacted by the cost of uh, uh, transportation and shipping, as also Gabriele mentioned. But I think the, the interesting data that we can share is that um, Italy exported to China with an increased export uh, that is higher to the majority of the large economies in the world. In this regard, the criteria to compare this trend are exactly the same. Therefore, the fluctuation of the RMB uh, for an exchange rate uh, and the cost for uh, shipping uh, can be in a similar way uh, considered as an impact to all kind of uh, international uh, uh, trade transactions. So what I want to say is that um, Italy had a, an excellent performance in exporting to China, 
and, uh, and did better in terms of an increase compared to other uh, large economies. We can switch to the other uh, slide. <clears throat> what I also think is interesting because for me, 2022 will be very interesting, very relevant for all kinds of business sectors uh, for one uh, specific tax trend, that is uh, the giant free trade agreement promoted and signed by China with the uh, other 14 economies, that is uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership between China and Southeast Asia, ASEAN Association of 10 member countries, with the Northeast Asia, that is uh, Japan and South Korea, and with the Pacific uh, major economies, that are Australia and uh, New Zealand. So for me, the interesting factor is that uh, if we consider uh, US China trade and European Union trade, we know that there is a deficit in uh, the trade balance. And this is why, for instance, we consider uh, there is uh, there are duties and uh, or or a trade war between US and China or different approach in terms of uh, tariffs that has been in, uh, implemented to correct from the United States strategy policy to reduce this gap to reduce the um, unbalance. Uh, uh, between the export and the import for the two large countries. Similar situation we have for European Union, except Germany, but opposite situation we have for regional comprehensive economic partnership. That means that uh, the Asia Pacific, where China is the leading economy, uh, actually has a gain in uh, exporting to China compared to the import. That means that is one of the basis, one of the reason why regional comprehensive economic partnership was important for all the other members, was important for, for Japan, South Korea, Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. This means that uh, no matter the trend in terms of uh, relations between countries, in terms of trade, there is a clear phenomenon of this uh, uh, gain for the regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, uh, members, markets. <clears throat> and I think this will be more and more relevant uh, 2022 and uh, during the next years. We can switch to the next slide. Okay, here we have, uh, um, we have uh, data confirming that China is uh, the top economy in terms of trade and is the top economy in terms of export. So here we have a comparison during the years uh, to understand uh, the global trade of China, how uh, has been increased, and also uh, the total export and the total import, and also the percentage of uh, increase or decrease during the years. So 2021, we have a significant increase. Of course, we may consider a V effect due to the pandemic, but still trade with China means to trade with the country that is the top trader in the world and, um, and is also one of the top market for a number of sectors. Next slide. Um, here again, in a, in, in a different representation, the same criteria, the same idea, the increase of trade of China. And this is, uh, let's say, the uh, key economic influence of China with other regions. And this is why uh, also China market is more and more relevant for the Asia Pacific region, thanks uh, to the special free trade agreement between 15 different economies. Uh, next slide. In terms of Italy, China, and in terms of fishing, according to the data up to uh, October 2021 from the um, Italian Trade Agency, uh, we may consider uh, an excellent performance, a good performance of the uh, of the, the the country exporting in in this specific uh, uh, sector. 
and uh, with uh, an aggregated uh, value of export equivalent to 16%. We know that uh, the largest part of the export from Italy to China is related to uh, machineries, industrial machineries, but uh, the fishing sector is uh, equivalent in this, let's say, portion of the year to uh, at least 16% of the export. And uh, in, in, in this regard, we shall consider also uh, different fluctuation and also uh, a different kind of grow during the year. Here we have a, a comparison between uh, 2020 and, and 2021, where we can see that uh, 2021, thanks to the V effect, thanks to another uh, number of uh, criteria, showed a, a significant uh, improvement. In my perspective, actually, the Bolton Road Memorandum uh, um, is, is also impacting the export of Italy to China. The reason is that it has been signed in 2019, and this brings some uh, political direction or, uh, let's say, a closer relation between Italy and China. And the impact in terms of trade can be seen not the day after, uh, not the month following the signature of the MOU, but I consider can be seen also this year and can be seen later on. So I think there is a, um, a special relation still in terms of recognizing uh, Italy as a quality uh, product to be imported. Next slide. Also, Gabriele mentioned uh, generally in terms of tax, uh, what is uh, uh, the kind of tax that we shall consider. We shall consider always duties when we import goods from abroad. Uh, Italy and China, they are countries that are members of the WTO. This means that they can enjoy a special tariff rate, a special uh, percentage of duties that is the most favored nation rate. And the most favorite nation rate for the majority of different items, different customs, uh, uh, tariffs, uh, classifications, is between um, uh, 6, uh, 8, uh, and, and 10% in terms of duty. So <clears throat> no member of the um, WTO, they have higher duties. Um, Italy, China, they have a special most favorite nation rate that uh, grant this kind of duty. And in terms of VAT, we have a standard VAT rate that is 13% that is impacting the value of the import aggregated with the value of the customs that we shall, duties that we shall pay. In case we export from China to Italy or from China to abroad, from China to any other jurisdiction, uh, no matter which one is the jurisdiction, we shall consider a uh, uh, VAT export refund. And the VAT export refund on this kind of sector is generally 13%. This means that China, of course, is promoting the export in, uh, let's say, garment and the uh, apparel sector to promote uh, this direction exporting in this uh, specific uh, uh, market. So we have an advantage. We have uh, uh, neutral VAT in case we shall export. What we paid uh, as, a, as a input VAT can be totally enjoyed as a refund. This generally for the large, uh, largest part of the, of the codes. Next slide. Cross-border has been touched by, by also uh, Gabriele. So for cross-border, we shall consider that um, uh, for B2C, we may enjoy a special treatment that grant uh, uh, zero duty, no duty, uh, of course, on, uh, uh, let's say, small scale transactions that we may consider generally as a single transaction uh, up to 5,000 RMB and uh, with an annual uh, uh, limit uh, volume of transaction equivalent to 26,000 RMB uh, by uh, individual consumer. <clears throat> and, um, and we also have a kind of reduction on the, uh, let's say, 
taxable uh, amount uh, for the, uh, VAT that is up to 70%. So a 30% decrease in terms of uh, um, taxable amount subject to a standard VAT 13%, while above a certain volume, a certain value, we shall consider to have a full VAT. These goods sold through uh, the special cross-border e-commerce uh, uh, method cannot be sold again in the domestic market. And the uh, uh, B2B2C model is not allowed. That means that, um, uh, let's say, only foreign companies can sell to local uh, individuals, uh, consumer in China, and cannot be resold to companies and to other business within China. Next the slide. Here there is an example of uh, a platform for cross-border that is Kaola, but is generally, uh, as mentioned by previous uh, um, persons uh, that uh, is important to consider that this kind of a platforms, they can help the foreign companies to handle, to manage uh, all major part of bureaucracy uh, to effect uh, declaration and to manage uh, uh, payments uh, and uh, the admin part that uh, is, is uh, a service often uh, uh, important for the foreign uh, businesses. And then um, according to the trend, we have a positive comments from uh, uh, the Italian trade agency, considering that uh, in, the, in the first half of um, 2021, the Italian products in this sector uh, have been uh, uh, positioned as uh, the top uh, uh, between uh, main fashion exporters uh, to China. And uh, uh, even Italian products surpassed the French products uh, with an increase of 96% compared to the same period in 2020 against uh, the increased uh, percentage of export uh, 58 of France. So in this regard, it is also increased this highlight of uh, the, the good performance of Italian export to China. Next slide. A brief overview of uh, taxation for companies that are investing in China, for companies that they want to have a presence, they already exported, they already have a, pre they already have a, a good approach with the market, uh, and they want to increase their presence with, uh, with the local entity. First of all, we shall consider that also for 2022 has been confirmed the, the very special low tax regime for uh, small uh, and micro profit companies. So 2.5% company income tax for companies up to 1 million RMB. That is uh, very special and is for small companies and is for startup companies during the first year period. But we have 10% up to 3 million RMB profit. That is um, also an excellent rate lower compared to other uh, uh, jurisdictions. Of course, uh, China is promoting uh, uh, the development of other provinces, uh, and, and in the West, we also have uh, a special uh, tax policy to promote investments um, in, the, in the key provinces of, of the West. And uh, of course, uh, we, we heard about Hainan, Ainan um, is key for retail, is key for fashion. We saw that uh, many fashion brands, uh, many retail brands uh, from Italy and from abroad, they had the top performance in the world during this pandemic phase in Aiko, in Aiko city. So the shop in Aiko, capital city of the province of uh, the island, uh, Ainan Pro, uh, Island, was uh, the shop with the best performance uh, worldwide. This, of course, due to the pandemic, related to the fact that of the size of Chinese market and uh, due to the uh, only travel allowed for Chinese to Aiko or to Ainan. So Ainan is uh, a key destination to be considered also for tax reason, 
15% company income tax and a free trade port that grant uh, uh, zero duty and uh, other kind of benefits uh, uh, importing in that uh, area. Um, next slide. I want to mention that uh, between uh, uh, different trend in 2022, we have uh, important uh, tax treaties and uh, trade uh, treaties. I already mentioned the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that to me is the most important uh, tax trend in 2022, signed in 2020, already effective um, and will grant lower duties for uh, trade of uh, made in China products to all the uh, 15 countries that are member of the uh, agreement and uh, uh, law duties for all made in regional comprehensive economic partnership for the export to China. But another very relevant agreement is the tax treaty between Italy and China, again signed on the same day of the Belt and Road Memorandum. And uh, I consider this the best tax treaty between all the West European countries and also the best tax treaty between all the G7 countries with China. As been signed in 2019, has been approved by the Italian Senate in uh, 2020, and we may expect that will be approved also by the Chamber of Deputies of Italy in 2022. So personally, I expect this tax treaty will be implemented on uh, uh, January 1st, 2023, as the earliest date. So will be effective from 2023 and approved in 2022. This will grant half taxation on dividends paid for investment between China and Italy. So it's very significant. Um, but, but China, as you see from this slide, is uh, promoting new tax treaty, new uh, trade treaty that will also allow some uh, improvement in trade with different regions. Next slide. So here, yeah, I, I simply uh, concluded with uh, a map of China with the 34 administrative divisions. I always consider that it's very important to have a correct understanding of this giant market, not only of uh, uh, Shanghai city that is uh, the fashion city for uh, uh, a number of factors, and not only the major, uh, let's say, economic centers, but also to the provinces that grant special incentives, like the Hainan province that we mentioned, that is southern of China, and is a key destination for, uh, for retail. So I think we can, um, we can probably skip to the last part of the Q&A together with the other participants. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for, for the, your presentation. Um, so yeah, I will now move into the Q&A. We have already received a few questions. And maybe uh, I will start maybe with those for Zoe. And in particular, one question which I actually wanted to, I, I, I had the same question and I wanted to ask, uh, to ask you the same question, Zoe. Basically, <laughs> there is one question. You have been speaking about big brands, what about, but what about small brands which cannot afford such expensive events and marketing campaigns? Um, mm -hmm. Even if they choose e-commerce, Chinese consumers do not know the small brands and probably, uh, and even if small brands will be cheaper than big brands, but they might still be more expensive than Chinese local brands. So how to mm. compete with big brands, how to cope with, uh, with the guochao, with the, with, the, with the national tide that you mentioned, and yeah, what is your... Mm. Yeah, I think uh, in general, uh, because this webinar will show the opportunities for the emerging brands, uh, the opportunities are coming from uh, these two main uh, groups, Y Generation and Gen Z. They are very uh, close, especially the Gen Z. They are the internet citizens, even of course for, for uh, millenniums as well. So I think this open, the possibility for emerging brands because before even you, you come to China landing in this market you can reach them but now there's an open door the digital development so 
for this communication, uh, as I shared, these two group of people is very uh, important to create this community I, um, recognition, identity recognition. So I think for a smaller brand, it's very important first to make a clear message, what kind of message or community that your brand is uh, creating or because I think now uh, it's really a flat word. Um, Generation Z in China, Gen Z in Europe, they won't have such difference as before. So I think the communication, the message that the brand should be clear to uh, transfer through uh, e-commerce uh, digital, digital campaign. Uh, of course, that's also need creativity because um, to pass the message from internet, uh, there are also many marketing tools. And also in China, there are so many tools to uh, develop, to promote a message that's also need to study. That is another case, but there's open the opportunity for small brands. And the second, uh, for the experience, um, I also see the uh, question from, uh, from the chat. Um, that's very true because um, luxury brands in China, they organize fantastic events. For smaller brands, what should we do to create this um, interaction? If the brands who has already the sales channel in China, which if you choose the um, platform like Linkafford or like Joyce or like other very good multi-brand buyers shop because now China has a lot of multiple brand shops. They are also uh, organizing events. Maybe the event is not that big, but at least create uh, a possibility for small brands. For example, using the internet, we can make a small session uh, to see uh, via the internet, the designers and uh, having some uh, interaction, that will be also unique experience that we can create. Uh, so I think we see the opportunity from the digital side and we need to use them. Um, sometimes it's not because of money, it's not because of whether we are coming or not. For example, Supreme, that's a very famous streetwear brand. They didn't came, enter China market, but Chinese consumers, even globally, they are very well sold. What's the reason? I think the reason behind is really because the brand communicate a clear message. And when people buy this brand, they feel kind of coming into this community. So I think that is the opportunity for small brands. Um, and uh, that's why my suggestion also for them uh, to consider to create a WeChat uh, shop or WeChat program, WeChat, WeChat official account that is called WeChat ecosystem. Since uh, WeChat is a very big tool in China uh, in terms of marketing, also uh, sales and CRM management, I think this is a very good way for brands to consider. Um, also, uh, WeChat development is also very quick. Every day, every month, they have new tools. Um, but uh, if you are in, interested in WeChat, maybe next session, Alessio can organize a theme for WeChat. Yeah, but uh, I think there are more opportunities. Mm, I don't yeah. know whether I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you mentioned WeChat. I also mentioned before we have very specific guidelines on how to open a WeChat store on it. Um, so another question that it's my question. Uh, it's, it's not. It doesn't come from the chat. You mentioned that uh, you know to open a WeChat account and and publish content from there. So if let's say you only had I don't know one thousand euro, let's say uh, mm. number D, how would you you know how would you spend this one thousand euro to to bring uh, users to your WeChat account? Because if you're a small brand, you bring the WeChat account, you have no followers. How would you spend your small amount of money to you know, um, make your account known uh, in China? What would okay. you do? 
Okay, that's a very challenging question. One thousand yes. euro, almost a uh, seven, seven thousand. Well, it could be ten thousand euro. It's like okay. a small so, amount. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, if I'm a foreign brand, because uh, maybe they don't have so many resources. Because if I do this job, I can use my um, media resources to do the promotion. So if have no uh, resources, um, I think um, I will split this um, money of um, a great part to find uh, a proper aid KOL because um, that is the private domain uh, uh, attraction that maybe we, we, we can use. Um, in China, the top uh, level KOL are very expensive, um, but there are some middle, middle ones uh, we can select to invite them to do some campaign, but we should carefully choose uh, whether they really, uh, how to say, uh, treat the content and the, the good target. And the second, I think I will split uh, a small part on the um, uh, PR and the media side uh, because uh, there are some agency who can help to do some uh, press release sent. It's not like, uh, you know, so that won't spend uh, big money, but you, you can split out the, the news. Um, if still I can have some money, I will do a beautiful design, uh, uh, maybe a Jeep, uh, you know, a Jeep campaign, you know, to make this uh, campaign or, you know, more as attractive as possible. Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you, Zoe. I, I know it was a very challenging question, uh, but I think it, it was a great answer. And, and actually maybe I think if someone, if some of the participants have questions, maybe are looking for recommendations of KOLs or somebody in the fashion, in the apparel sector, maybe I think they can contact you uh, if, if, if you if you agree, if you don't mind, because you will be yeah. able to redirect them. Um, another question for you. Um, how do you deal with the issue of important imported products now that Chinese consumers are so scared about foreign products coming from overseas as they might bring COVID? Maybe maybe I think this is more an issue for food products, but not, but I don't know. Do you have any experience? Have you heard anything? Because for instance, for food products, um, there are a lot of reports that food might be contaminated with COVID and there is some, let's say, Food, imported food products are having a bad image. Have you seen something similar, let's say, in fashion apparel uh, sector, or what's your experience? Mm, uh, I think for this issue, yes, it happened, and also reporting on the news. But I think the custom in China, they really did a severe check for this mm -hmm. risk. So if you can receive a parcel home, normally they already passed uh, several, several severe check. Uh, so I think for the moment, we, we can assure, assure this, it won't be a big problem for, you know, for selling for the international um, transaction. So I think it won't be a big concern. Okay, thank you. And <laughs> still another question for you before moving to the other speakers. Um, you mentioned a few of the of the platforms for cross-border e-commerce, um, but can you can you maybe mention a few other examples of which are the most popular ones? Uh, yes. Yeah. Topic? Actually, if you did the research, if you do research, you can find a lot of names. Uh, I listed in uh, today's sharing three names uh, because I think these three names. Uh, they can have a relevant and a, a good image to protect the brand image, which I think is very important. And the second, this um, platform are very active uh, in China with convenient service and uh, very quick logistic service, which I think is a good choice, especially uh, I, I mentioned Farfetch, um, 
match special, which also have huge team in, in, team in, in Hong Kong and uh, my Teresa as well. Yesterday, I also checked a little bit on them. Um, so uh, I think that's the reason I mentioned these three. Of course, lots of many others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Taobao and Tim, they open cross-border service as well. Thank you, Zoe. And and I assume each of these platforms maybe have different, let's say, um, are used by different target groups, maybe some by younger people, yes. some by women, some by first tier cities. So uh, each of these platforms has its own strengths and, and, and mm -hmm. let's say cons compared to others. Um, thank you. Now I will move um, to another question, actually for Mr. Gabriele Bessi, uh, a question that I have. Um, because we see this question very often. So talking about the customs, the customs clearance process, according to your experience, what do you think is the, let's say the most frequent issue, mistake that happens during the customs clearance process? In my opinion is in the um, documents preparation. Um, my suggestion is for the is for the um, manufacturers to to gather uh, and to and to keep track of the the data I mentioned in the presentation, such as composition, uh, sizes, uh, uh, and so on, uh, and also pictures of each um, uh, item. Uh, because the most important thing is the correct identification of the of the HS code to be to be declared to the to the custom. Uh, because an incorrect HS code can lead to um, a custom inspection, and in case there is a, a considerable difference of uh, of duty to be paid, then. Uh, uh, the the entity from the custom that will be um, that will entry into this issue is the, is the anti smuggling. So the correct uh, identification of the HS code is fundamental, and it can be done only if the information from the manufacturer are consistent. Very good. And, and am, am I right uh, to say that HS codes in China might be slightly different from, from abroad? I think the seventh to the tenth digits, I think. Yeah, it's correct. It's correct. It's correct. It's quite uh, similar to the, to, the, to, the, to the European one. However, it has some, uh, some difference in the, in the last digits. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, there was also no, another question for you, if it's possible um, to share maybe a template of this master file that you mentioned before, if there okay. is a required template or it's just, um, you know, an internal. No, this is, this is just, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a requirement from the, from the custom, it's more uh, like a, a tool to be, to be used for the correct, uh, uh, as I mentioned, identification of this code and the custom declaration as well as the as the labeling part so i can certainly share it i don't know if i need to do it with you or if uh, they, they want to send me the their email address i can i can send it um you can yeah maybe you can send it to me or and then if there is somebody okay. who is interested uh yeah they can write to us in any moment. Also write to Mr. Gabriele directly. It's, it's up to you, basically. Uh, we will be both available to do so. Um, thank you, Gabriele. And maybe I see a couple of questions on cross-border e-commerce. I don't know if either you or Lorenzo want, want to um, respond to them. There is, uh, in my knowledge, also companies which are not foreign funded. So Chinese companies can sell through cross-border e-commerce. Have you heard about this? Can you clarify this point or? Uh, the, the main thing is to, is to understand where the, the, uh, where the goods is coming, is coming from, whether it's located in, uh, in already in the domestic market 
or, or, or overseas. This is the, 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 the thing to, to be considered. But anyway, of course, that also local companies uh, are doing e-commerce. So if cargo is coming from overseas, it's then cross-border. While if it's uh, already in the domestic markets, it's a, it's a normal e-commerce. Okay. Thank you, Gabriele. And um, Lorenzo, I don't know if you want to add something or... Yeah, in this can... regard, I think Gabriele uh, replied uh, co correctly. I do agree. Uh, Cross-border means uh, that, that we cross the border uh, with the foreign uh, jurisdiction. Uh, but we know that uh, Chinese companies, they also do uh, international investments, uh, maybe via another uh, jurisdiction, but, but that become a foreign entity doing cross-border with the local uh, consumer. And I think um, there was another question related to uh, this uh, special tax incentive, no duty and uh, reduction of VAT. Um, through platform or without platform. Actually, the tax regulation mainly refer to a cross-border transaction between a, a company and a, a, a consumer. So generally, we can consider that can be enjoyed also without a platform, with a, with a if the final client is a consumer and not, again, uh, another company. Of course, uh, I consider that uh, it is uh, uh, much more frequent, uh, popular, uh, easier <clears throat> to use the services of this platform. But again, the criteria is uh, <clears throat> cross-border, so from abroad to China, and uh, uh, to a consumer, and uh, so between a company and a consumer. Thank you, Lorenzo. There was also maybe a, a question that I have. I think where, when you were mentioned introducing the tax rate for cross-border e-commerce, you mentioned that uh, the custom the, the, the duties the custom duties are are not uh, not need to be paid. But what about consumption tax on 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 fashion and apparel products? Is there any consumption for, uh, tax for for this? The consumption tax is an indirect taxation. Uh, so in a similar way to the VAT is uh, reduced as well and uh, is reduced in a similar way to the VAT. That means that we can enjoy a reduction focusing on, again on the same uh, volume, the same value that are, uh, uh, let's say, a small value transaction for uh, final consumers uh, that uh, purchase from abroad from the same company uh, from from abroad within this special tax benefit within a, a total uh, amount that again is is uh, limited <clears throat> there was also another question that uh, i would like to to comment because i saw that one participant said uh, uh, why don't you organize also this event in other cities, like uh, in other provinces, like, like Hunan or others? <clears throat> For this, at least as a China-Italy chamber, what I have to say is that um, I do agree. We try more and more to involve, uh, let's say, companies and uh, entrepreneurs and, and people living in different provinces. That is also why I usually uh, conclude or use the map of China to show the, the variety of different uh, provinces for the advantages from tax, but also for the, the difference in terms of uh, market. And uh, for instance, we organized uh, for food and beverage specifically an event uh, in, in Kunming, and, uh, and we are also interested in promoting uh, a border member meeting in the provinces where the chamber has no office or has no desk to try to create smaller events because I do believe that is very interesting uh, to have more information about uh, the market uh, and the companies that are uh, present uh, in uh, provinces different, of course, from uh, uh, Guangzhou, uh, the Guangdong province or the municipalities or the top, uh, uh, let's say, GDP provinces of, uh, of China. So I do agree and, uh, and we are also going in this direction, paying attention to also uh, other provinces, uh, regions and, and markets, I believe are more and more uh, interesting and important.
Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, by the way, uh, I saw already a couple of participants are asking for personal contacts of the speakers because they were not included in the email. So if you want, uh, please feel free to write them in the chat so that um, you know everybody can can contact you eventually. Um, another another question I think still relates to cross border e commerce. Um, I think. I think cross-border e-commerce uh, can only be considered as such if the product is sold through a cross-border e-commerce platform, right? It's not like if you have, uh, if you sell it through other means, uh, I think it doesn't, it's not considered cross-border e-commerce. Am, am I correct? Like uh, if you sell it through Taobao International or uh, Tmall International, then um, and the transaction is is handled by the by the platform, then it qualifies a cross border e commerce and all the preferential policies, the tax policies there. But if you sell it through, for instance, another foreign platform like uh, I don't know eBay or whatever company website, it doesn't qualify for for, for these preferential taxes, right? Actually, I consider that the regulation focus on the individual, on the consumer. So formally, I consider that the individual can theoretically apply and enjoy this special, that are, this special treatment. I believe there are there is more complexity in this regard, while it is a standard and uh, and frequent and adopted by the the platform to manage the transaction. But but formally, the special uh, duty exemption is related to an individual that is uh, uh, able to um, to import uh, within a certain volume transaction and within a certain uh, uh, total amount for the year. Uh, goods from abroad. So I consider uh, theoretically, formally, it is possible to use also other system. In the practice, I think uh, considering the complexity and, and considering um, the trend, I, I believe that uh, majority shall focus on, on the platform, yeah. Thank you, Lorenzo. And maybe another question, I think still for Zoe. Um, <laughs> most fashion brands that want to enter the Chinese market have no stock in China. Um, do we think it's enough to push online sales? Don't, don't Chinese consumers expect quick deliveries? And also what if uh, fashion brands don't have a physical shop where fashion products can be tried on and maybe returned. For instance, uh, by a bigger size, how, how does it work the return? How, how, how does it, how can this be successful? Mm. Um, I think if the brands is facing the issue, uh, the logistics, that's the thing because that means you have already reached the customers and they are eager to receive the products, right? So to solve this problem, we need to find reliable um, various service for the uh, stock service. And of course, um, I think can anticipate the sales, but there's always a risk, I think. So uh, if working with a cross-border platform, that issue can be um, resolved because it, once you get the order, you can organized for the uh, logistics. Of course, uh, some of the platform also need to receive the products in the head to make sure they have a quick uh, delivery. So that will be the same to save this uh, problem. And the second issue, um, the second question is, uh, sorry, the second question is, uh, what if they like? What if they don't have a physical product, a physical shop where fashion products can be tried? And maybe because my understanding is, even if you have, if you have a warehouse in, in a bonded zone, people cannot just go there and, and try the you know try the clothes. So, of course, of course. Mm, uh, actually, uh, in China, I think if you really want to do some. Uh, better sales. I think the um, PR communication is really important. I think we can um, give a small budget uh, 
to work with a PR agency, which have the showroom uh, service. So you can share uh, one set of the newest collection and they can do some uh, seeding and do some uh, PR works. And all these materials can be helpful for the same for the online communication, especially we have the resource to connect some KOLs. Uh, so that this is a good way. And then um, um, for, for customer try the, yeah, try the collection, I think would better work with um, real, uh, real retail uh, shops. And um, there are really many good uh, lists of multi-brand shops in China um, targeted different uh, positioning of brands and the different clients. I think that's maybe need brands to do more research to see which are the um, most proper or suitable targeted brands. And also China, um, for example, during the uh, fashion week period, there are many uh, showroom services in China and that they take care of your order, um, dealing with the communication with uh, different multiple shops. I think that's also a way for um, emerging brand to work with. Mm, because when we say emerging brands, uh, we, we don't know exactly which level they are. Um, but I think um, always to choose the most suitable partners is the most important. important. Because, yeah. and, and by the way, since we're talking about partners, uh, the, the USME Center, if you need some background checks or preliminary due diligence, uh, we can help you with that for free, of course. So uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, maybe maybe since we don't have other questions, uh, of course, I would invite uh, other, other, other questions. If there are other questions, please, uh, we have just a few minutes left. But before that, in the meantime, I would still ask you another question. Please bear with me. Um, because there was somebody in the chat talking about uh, Hunan or lower tier cities. And so my question is, if I was an, if I am an emerging brand, a small brand, and, and of course we talk about e-commerce, okay, but if I want to choose the offline uh, channels like uh, multi-brand stores and everything, if I am an emerging brand, if you were an emerging brand, Zoe, would you maybe go to Shanghai, like the capital of fashion, or maybe would you go to, um, you know, um, like first tier cities, or maybe you would also consider other like lower tier cities, such as in other parts of China? What would okay. you do? Hmm. So first I will uh, do anal uh, analysis of my brand. Uh, my brand's positioning in the Chinese market target, uh, for example, the press range, the, uh, the uh, collection style, which are the customers that I uh, targeted. That's really, really important. And the second, if I want to come to Chinese market to just for your question, I think I will choose a showroom first. A showroom. And yeah, to save time and energy and, you know, take advantage of their resources as well, because they are dealing with multiple brand shops. So I can have a first feedback from the market to see what kind of multiple brand are interested into my collections and uh, what are their feedback, because they will feedback, customer feedbacks to the showrooms and I will have them. So I think that will be a shortcut to enter, to see the feedback, and then um, to adjust the, my strategies. Of course, I think this really uh, a first step. And then later, we can develop um, better positioning uh, arrangement of the cities and uh, campaigns. And then later, maybe have a, a team or even one person you know, in China to, and then to, maybe develop retails and then become bigger. But always there is a first step to, to come here. And don't be afraid of China. Even it's huge market, there's always a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. I like this. There is always a way statement. <laughs> um, all right. So thank you, Zoe. I, I don't see other questions. So unless 
the other speakers want to add something. Um, I don't know if Gabriel or Lorenzo want to add something or otherwise I think we can just close the webinar here. I would like, I would like to thank Alessio because I think uh, this event and other cooperation between China Italy Chamber and the other chambers and the USB Center is, um, is um, interesting, important. I think we had uh, many participants today with many questions, uh, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's good to proceed in this uh, path, this direction. So thank you, Alessio, and uh, let's cooperate for other uh, online and on-site events from Hunan to Beijing. Thank you, Lorenzo, definitely. and, and uh would be would be very interesting to to explore something in hunan we have i have to say we have never done anything there uh but of course there's always a uh, first time and as zoe mentioned there's always a way so <laughs> so yes um thank you lorenz of course to you and to the support of the italian chamber we are very always very happy to do things together and to see uh such uh, big interest from from the uh from the business community um very last comment, in the next days, maybe tomorrow or Wednesday, we're going to send an email to all the participants, of course, with the link uh, to our YouTube channel where you can rewatch this recording. Um, also links to download the slides if you, if you want. And then a link to a very short survey, uh, feedback survey that we would really appreciate if you could fill, uh, which will help us to, uh, you know, um, organize, uh, have new ideas for other webinars to organize in the future. So uh, that would be all. Uh, thank you all the speakers again, for the participants for joining and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.